the one. All right. Hello, all, and welcome to the Brave Sound Podcast. Today, we're both super excited to be presenting Mr. Shy Maestro, who just released an incredible record entitled Human, which you guys are more than welcome to check out. So I'd first like to reiterate the job that Austin and I have on this show, which is to uncover the stories, processes, and worldviews behind some of the most creative and artful musicians of today. And Shy Maestro is absolutely no exception to this. Since his debut with his own trio in 2011, Shy has shaped a strong and unique personal identity and has portrayed an incredible musical fluidity, making Shy and his band one of the most powerful and harmonious groups in jazz today. Shy has six records out currently under his own name. 2018 marked an important year for Shy, signing with major jazz label ECM and recording his first album, The Dream Thief, under the label, featuring his trio, but also himself as a solo pianist. In its review of The Dream Thief, All About Jazz spoke of a searching lyrical atmosphere, emotional eloquence, and communal virtuosity that serves the music, all of which also applies to human. Shy's latest release on ECM, where Maestro's outgoing, highly communicative band with fellow Israeli Ofri Nemya on drums and Peruvian bassist Jorge Roder, becomes a quartet with the inspired addition of U.S. trumpeter Philip Dizak. Shai's expansive pianism is well matched by Dizak's alert, quick-thinking approach to improvising. And, as ever, Maestro is taking the music forward while also respecting its sense of tradition. Human was recorded at Studios La Boisine in the south of France in February 2020 and produced by Manfred Escher. So without further ado, welcome, Shai Maestro. Thank you. Thanks for the introduction. So I promise that I have questions for you about the music on your latest album, but I want to first ask about the album cover. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so it's the most minimal cover out of all your albums. So what's hmm. the meaning behind this cover and how does it relate to the music inside? Yeah, great question. So that, that one is a result of a brainstorming together with the ECM guys. Um, that we um we we had a title we had we knew that that record is going to be called human and then human is pretty much the most generic word you know possible it's like it's shared by everyone and it is so complex and there's so many different ways we can look at this word like so many different angles where we come from and so um, we, we just thought that like trying to, to really express human on the cover would be impossible. Like we initially thought about like, a, you know, a close up face of a, like an old man or something called human, but that we kind of feeding the purpose. So it, like I'm, I'm more into like, uh, contrasts, um, uh, in, in music and, and in general. And here I came with the, up with the idea of just a line that was my initial thought. And then, and then they brought this idea of just kind of like a square that looks like it was drawn by a kid. Mm. Or something. And uh, we were like, "Oh, great! That's abstract enough to allow the word human to have its own uh, habitat, mm. its own place." So, what caused you to name the album "Human"? Yeah. Um, so it's it's a pretty yeah it's a, it's a long explanation, but I'll try to make it um, short. Um, the result of a really long process of me uh, trying to stop trying, if that makes sense, uh, playing music. And so the initial um, intention or like the intention that I had for many years was to try and make something special when I go or when I, when I compose and try, try to make things, try to make them transcend, you know, try to, try to find this transcendence. Um, and um, a some sort of conclusion or like something that I learned um, I'm, I'm practicing meditation for, for, for a while now and one of the things that I learned is that when you try too hard it doesn't happen mm. and so the thing is really to learn how to accept uh, and, and, and let things be and um, musically speaking um, or talking about the music uh, 
it's about letting the the entire spectrum of your experiences and emotions flow into your uh, and a good story that or story that I have can 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 explain it well. Um, is that I got an opportunity to go to this beautiful castle in south in south of France. I think it was south of France. Um, to compose for like a week. That was just like you know, just come on over. It's like countryside, super beautiful, like you know, green mountains, cows outside, and you have like a private chef that will cook for you, and you have a Stanway D and a concert hall at your disposal, and just come here and compose. And I was like, oh man, that's Amazing. Let me let me go ahead and do that. So I went there, um, and you know, conditions were, were, were incredible. And every day I attended the piano and tried to write music. Um, and the music that I wrote was terrible <laughs> during that week. It's just like <laughs> shallow and came up pretentious and kind of like didn't have any, any honesty and truth in it. And I was like, wow, man, that's that's crazy. And then I went back to New York and, you know, I land in New York and the cab driver is yelling at you and there's so much shit happening in the terminal and it was like, and then you have to pay your taxes and everything, you know, it's like, <laughs> from that mess, like you go home and sit next to the piano and then like, whoop, a song just comes out because it's related to life or related to my human experience. And so like the transcendence, the, the, the attempts to, to transcend, like that, that doesn't work for me. And so about that, it's just kind of like, Blurring the lines between those two experiences, like and also like you know, going on stage, oh, it's always been like a stressful experience. Like, oh, you know, like I feel a little bit down sometimes, and but like we, you know, we need to play a good show, and so like pull it together and go on stage, and um, and now it's kind of like, hey, you know, if I'm feeling down, I'll just start with a ballad. Um, just uh, if I'm, you know, my hands are shaking, I'll just play a trill or right, you know, like what, whatever, <laughs> just. Uh, Kind of a flow on stage, and the hang continues on stage, and then it will continue with the guys off stage. Mm. Yeah. Well, Shad, just a, a side note, just so we can get the best capture of this possible. The internet is a little, to me, it sounds a little flaky, being that you're in Israel and we're in, in on the East Coast. Uh, so yeah, it, it helps when you're a little you're a little tighter on the mic. I hate to okay, cool. be that way, Not but I, I think that'll help. Um, All right. But that's really interest, interesting that the sweat and grime of the New York City hustle helped you create, how would you describe it, more compelling music or just better in general? or Just, to, you know, it represents better who I am at the moment, you know? Like, I'm not a guy who would go on a mountain and write music for a week. It's, it's, uh, it's an out of... The ordinary experience for me that's not how i that's not how i live my life i when i'm in new york i go to smalls and i go to the vanguard and i play with the cats and at home we do some sessions and like there's a there's, there's life and that's that's how yeah that's how i've been doing it for years and so there's no need to try too hard to do something mm. special just like that a lot of things somehow going away and leaving all your worries behind it it sounds like the music you were creating didn't represent life as truly as it does just because you weren't living life the way you you feel like you, you normally live life. It, it took away all these worries and, and it made a certain, um, like a bubble around you. Especially like, you know, we talk about Oh yeah, you're kind of low. It's a little hard to hear you. Oh, sorry. Uh, one second. Can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Is that better? Yeah. Um, yeah. And and so if we uh, if we talk about jazz and and I and I hate to use this this term, um, but um, this this music is is um, like uh, inherently it's tied to life. You know, it's Afro American music tied to the afro-american history and so like it's always been about that it's always always been about the, the human experience and, and i feel it's um to, to me it's a like creating it from like a this like a ivory tower is a little disconnected it's kind of like mm. missing the point right maybe we could talk about your first piece on the record time uh mm -hmm. yeah uh 
what, what struck me was overall about the whole record is that it's very visual. I felt like I could see places and I feel like uh, it, it could belong in a movie. You know, there could be a visual going along with it, a story of, of someone like, yeah. you know, just someone's life going going about. So when you were creating this music, did you have visuals in mind at all? Um, it's funny you ask it because like a year ago, I started writing music for film mm. um, officially for the, for the first time. So I'm working on like a feature film now and it's uh, it's very natural because that's how I hear music. So the stories behind are when, when I just writing music, not for, for a film. Um, the stories can be more abstract. There isn't like a character and like this guy went there and he fell in love with this woman and like you know it's just no no not really that. It's more the shape of of a, a story. Um, and so yeah. um, there's, there's been just one piece that I've written so far that is a painting. It's like one. It's, we're just trying to exp express a, a visual object in front of me but that was the only time the rest the rest is more abstract but but definitely it's definitely cinematic wait so, which piece did you say is like the one that you... painting it's from my first album okay yeah and is this are these films i assume they're going to be released that are you allowed to disclose any information about this or is it is too pre-release or something what? yeah it's with brad pitt and tarantino and uh, oh I, yeah <laughs> <laughs> no <laughs> i wish um, it's an Israeli film. It's a really beautiful film about um, about a um, um, a kid that has like a double life. Um, one is like uh, in the south of Israel, like a very like desert environment, you know, real real life as we as we know it, um, out of the out of the matrix, and then um, then life online, like Facebook oh. and mm. and all that. And so it's like it's really interesting for me to dive into that and like um, deal with like a you know, acoustic music versus electronics, like acoustic being the real world and electronic being the, the, the matrix. Um, yeah. And uh, yeah, it's, it's it's fun. I have 28 cues lined up. Yeah, it's a lot. As I'm looking at them right now. They're looking at me every day. I'm like, okay, you know, one by one, you co you conquer the, those small mountains. So, but it's fun, man. It's it's great. And so I, I, get, I get to work with... With amazing musicians here, there's a wonderful cello player. Um, she's a uh, half Japanese, half Iraqi. Which is wow! Crazy. <laughs> yeah, so she has any music, so she has like very like the Japanese kind of like uh, clean um, mm -hmm. touch, if I, if you so to speak. And, and then she she she's been studying with a master from Azerbaijan, so like she has like this oriental uh, flavor in playing in her playing, and um, so that's that's really really fun. So I'm working with her, and then with a singer songwriter, so it's gonna be very very um, varied. And um, yeah, I like it. I'm I'm really really into the into the challenge. Some orchestral writing, um, and then there's another project I'm working on in, in Japan. That will be that I can't talk about yet, but it's really yeah yeah. Well, it's interesting. I feel like, I, I don't know, jazz and film f film scoring sounds like two separate worlds, but I feel like a very, very large percentage of the guests we've had on this podcast have either done scores for film or said that they that's something they were very much interested in doing. Um, I think there's just something about the genre of film and the combination of sound and music that just... It gets, it's like one of the best mediums for storytelling. And as, um, I guess as jazz musicians, we feel like we can amplify our messages with the help of a master filmmaker and, and crew, you know? Um, yeah. I mean, you, you elaborated on it a little bit, but I'd like to ask further, is there any, is this something you've been wanting to do for a long time? Do you have, have you really studied any specific film scores or... Yeah, I'm on a co I'm on a constant quest with with film scoring, just like you know diving into the John Williams catalog and and then um, you know analyzing scene by scene and kind of second by second. It's crazy like how 
takes you from one place to another in in, in matter matter of seconds like modulate to like three different keys and then like this festive key of you know be it like harry potter walking into the the main hall or or the star wars stuff like whatever and then but then it comes from the, the villain perspective and like it's all in a very short time so it's a it's a beautiful challenge to to try to to, to try to do it um and in a way that will also be subtle enough that it wouldn't take too much attention which is which is super interesting you know when i write yeah. music or my band so it's it's 100 percent music so i'm like let's go you know like every, every i, I want to push things to the max and make things the most expressive you know as, as expressive as expressive as i can mm. sometimes with film scoring the interesting thing is like you know you're, you're there to support the, the film you know um and the great composers are the ones who manage to kind of forget about them during the film, but you kind of make a mental note of like, wow, this music is great, but like you're in the story, you know mm. what I mean? You, like, oh, Major Seven, killing, oh, he went. <laughs> you don't want that. Um, and so it's learning how to be more, more subtle and more um, learning to hold back, but in a, in a way that will, will be honest to the music, which, yeah. is, which is really neat. And there's some it, moments in some of my fav- favorite sim- film scores that like I, one thing I really like about my favorites is the use of motifs. Um, like for example, like in the Lord of the Rings, like the the motif that always comes on on that like Irish flute when they come back to the Shire, and you just feel so warm and right. fuzzy. Or like way less subtle is like the the Vader theme for John Williams. Like whenever he comes, it's like this motif. Um, yeah, have you ever written? When you think of melodies in your jazz compositions, like not for film scoring, do you you ever think of your motifs or melodies as characters or having certain personality types? Um, kind of. As I said, it's a little bit more uh, abstract than than writing for film. Um, however, there are some motifs that like some some. Uh, there's a certain language that has been developed on stage with the guys <clears throat> with Jorge and Ofri for the last uh, two years Ravitz before that mm-hmm. the drummer I, and I, now with Philip but with Philip we just played eight concerts it's way too short but even even with Philip like even in that context we managed to, to develop something um, so there's a language and like some word that's been developed and, and some words that are repeat repeating some motifs that just like a, reappear in like different places that are that are um, functioning as like a, a like a thread or like a link between the the songs. Um, so, for example, I didn't even notice. I kind of forgot about it. But like in the thief's dream on my record, I'm quoting the dream thief at some point. Uh. And, and it's like a, it's like a second. I, I and I, I forgot I forgot about it. And then I was a few days ago. I was I was walking deep and I, I listened to it and I was like, oh shit. Right, that's that's there, and like like mm. doo 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 dee da that that melody um, kept coming back uh, and doing concerts, and then then mold mold became molded into that or mel- morphed into other um, other things. Um, yeah, it was like the DNA of something new, mm. you know, like do 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 dee do dee. That could be just played that way. Um, just just quote it or do 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 dee do 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 dee do like those four or five notes can become like bass notes like roots for for example do and then you just like reharmonize it so it's very subtle it's not it's like it's it's no no one will ever know that this is the logic behind it but mm. but that's the material we're working with you know and, and so, like you mentioned that's material that Ofri and Jorge are just you know deeply familiar with at this point. So that is actually a possibility. You you play the, that in in less than a measure, and they're there with you, and it, it could yeah. become a baseline with Jorge around, and he knows the melody, and that, it's a Absolutely. really great relationship. Yeah, exactly. And so if I do that, and then like in the in the Dream Thief, it starts with do 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 do, and then like five minutes into the song, there's like a baseline that's like like one note. 
then that could be Jorge's reply, you know, to, 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 to just like mix and match, and it's like, um, it's really, it's really fun. It's like, it's like, uh, it's a big playground, and, and I like playing with with people who are playful, um, like the playful elements um, in element in music. So you know, people like you know, like Wayne's Quartet, for example, or obviously like Chikoria mm. that recently left us, and like you know, they were just very, you know, very playful people you know with a very deep knowledge and experience and they know how to play in a in a profound way and i, I like it so my inspiration from these guys you also Kirby. quote with the song in my heart a few times oh, did on, I? on the record yeah with, with philip too you guys would play the melody i think maybe he started it and then you you picked it up after that you know what i'm talking about oh. Um, I, I don't, but um, yeah, just direct me to the right place. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Probably, I mean, there's so many of these. It's like, um, these can be like straight up quotes or or things that are just like fractions of songs that maybe that's the, one of them that you don't really know it. You're just doing it and, and it's kind of drawing from your subconscious or something deep in your archive. Yeah, yeah. Maybe you played, maybe you played like, that song like a week before or whatever with a song yeah, like, like yeah so it was like in your subconscious somewhere yeah as i as i said like this music is built on the j- jazz vocabulary and so, so definitely coming, coming yeah out. uh you're talking about like playfulness and stuff but 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 um which is definitely from listening to the record a really big part of the record but also another part of the record that i noticed is these solis that you have with Philip, for right. instance, on Gigi, could you talk a little bit about the process for writing that solely and also the just like how how long did that that guys take for you guys to to record because it's really phenomenal. No, thank you. Um, so I'll start from the end. Uh, the recording time it, it was like in cinema mood was one take. That was the first and only take we've done mm. in the studio, which is the most challenge, challenging song on the album. I, I was, when we finished it, I was like, guys, just don't say anything. We got it. Like, okay. <laughs> that, I think is, is two takes. But uh, preparation preparation took a long ass time. Like when you, especially when you do, deal with these kind of materials who are so much more complex than my regular stuff I'd write or the traditional like melody head in you know improvisation head out and melody some chords and and so this is re- these are like extremely long unison and um unisons and um the beginning of the process started at the master class we gave I forget where it was some somewhere in Scandinavia um I forget exactly where it was and then there was this this girl that asked it was right after the Dream Thief uh, came out, and you know, I, I, I'm, I like the Dream Thief. I'm, I'm, I'm proud of it, and and and. But, but she said like, why don't you bring that energy to a record? You know that because on, on shows we we're we're taking it really out. Like it's we kind of play things that are not exactly just like as I said, like melody solos, melody, mm. and. And obviously, um, you know, you always latch on to. It's not wasn't a bad critic. It wasn't a, like criticism or, but but you always latch on the 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 yeah the negative side side of what people tell you. And and I, I gave it a thought, and, and then I was like, why well, she she's right. Um, so I wanted to bring that to an album, and so there were, there are two ways to go about it. Like one is just to go for it, you know, just like in the studio just just play um and let the music go out and um which we, we also we we're also doing that um on on human but the, the other one was like allowing composition to stop functioning in the traditional way and so that, that was the beginning of the process that master class and then the second uh, part that really kind of like um no, I'm, I'm missing vocabulary here, but that that really made it happen was uh, was the uh, Instagram post that, that Joel Ross, the wonderful vibraphone player, posted, and he just played this intro, 
And if you know Joel's music, it's 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 he's amazing. And um, one of the one of the intros were was really just chaotic. It was just like notes flying everywhere. Um, mm. uh, and it's so complex and so kind of like um, yeah. There's so much there's so much content in it that. There's a point where you give up trying to understand exactly, you know. Mm. Yeah, you can follow. It's like his mind is like everywhere, and, and you just kind of like lean back and embrace the the, the 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 energy and the color that is being thrown in your face, and and it's a, it's a different experience. Um, mm. um, and so, in a sentimental mood, was written um, with with this in mind, with with. The, the the notion of not trying to make it in you know just just put notes out there and so these are basically improvisations and so i improvise with my, my own my, my own way i, I recorded uh, gg i recorded in, in sentimental mood uh-huh. and i transcribed it and I, and i said like okay so we can just orchestrate that and you know arrange it here and there like change a note and here and then, um, but but these are essentially like improvisations, um, and so in Cinnamon Root was written for Joel and and I. We had we had we had a concert. I got a commission by the Jazz Gallery and the German Foundation to write music um, for this concert, and and I wrote it um, for Joel, Philip, and myself, um, and that's where we played in Cinnamon Mood for the first time. And then Gigi was written in uh, in uh, Denmark, and so I, I learned it, transcribed, transcribed it, and and taught it to the guys and then jorge and philip were like we want in yeah. on cinema and i was like uh sure but guys it's not written for your instrument i'm sorry like you know if i write for for a trumpet I, i'll i'll take in the fact that the person needs to breathe at some point you don't want anyone dying and so that doesn't have any space in it so uh, and the leaps are, are they don't make any sense on trumpet and on bass for sure but both of them were like no we want to do it and i said oh all right, do do your thing, and so Jorge made his own chart, and and Philip, uh, Philip figured out his Philip too, and like on his, in a similar mood, he made his own part, and it kind of like intertwined, um, and uh, yeah, and then we had to just figure it out, and I told Philip like, man, if you want to play in a similar mood, I mean, first of all, you're a trumpet hero, and I, I mean, wow, but do it. I have to be strict with my requirement which is that the melody should be played louder than the other parts mm. and so i had the melody like pull doo, 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 and then in between doo, 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 there's a space right and in that gap there was so much shit happening to like underneath the surface and i said like well you know so if you want to play all, all this like this should be loud and this should be soft mm. so it's hard enough just to play those things on trumpet, but like put in the dynamic aspect, you know, it's even, yeah, but he did it and, and I'm, I'm just really, really happy. With the result. Yeah, that's why you call Phil Dizak, right? <laughs> one of yeah, the, man. But, um, one of the people that can do it. Mm-hmm. One of the things that struck me just rhythmically about that track in particular, you know, it was just so playful. Um, infectious on in on an ellington song at that you know um but it, it did actually remind me of like the avishai cohen stuff uh i don't know if it has the same effect on you uh, but i would definitely like to ask you the effect that playing in avishai's trio had on your musicality and yeah yeah for sure artistry going forward absolutely um this track specifically, I don't, I, I don't really connect it to my time with, uh, with Abishai. But then again, things become kind of abstract. You know, your influences, and the, the journey, and the stuff that you soaked in throughout the years. Um, like it's a little hard to trace where you learned that word. Who taught you how to say, you know, like a glass, and who taught you how to say a, a fork? You know, you don't know. Like probably your parents, but, but things, things tend to just like get a little blurry. So. I'm sure his, his influence is there. And um, speaking of uh, soaking, yeah. So like, I'm my personality was always uh, very like much sponge-like. And so a, a, as a kid, if you know, I'll be in a room, I'll absorb a lot of information first of all, and then, but also like energy of 
of the people around me. I, I, um, and so spending five years in a band with someone, especially at that age, I, I joined his band when I was uh, 18 or 19. 18, I guess. Um, so from 18 to 23, which are very formative years you know, in a person's life, like a lot got absorbed. And so some some stuff, like I can I can recall some stuff, you know, you know, like comp composition and how to run a sound check, how to <laughs> check in a band at the, at the airport, <laughs> you know, like uh, 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 how to work with triads. Like he, he's really good with working with triads. Like um, so a lot of jazz vocabulary these days is like a lot of like extended chords with like major seven, sharp 11, and then 13. And like everything is super, like super imposed. Uh, but obviously it's really sticks to like triads and it's a whole there's a whole art form of how to voice lead using only triads so so that definitely is something I, I picked up uh, from him he's very um, influenced by uh, Cuban music um, he kind of turned me on to that uh, back in the day and I've been obsessed uh, with both Cuban music and flamenco for yeah like 10 12 years 13 years now um, I'm listening to it like every every day and like transcribing like percussion parts and and i'm taking, I'm, <laughs> I'm taking uh my my, my uh, i have a friend who's a great flamenco guitar player and he's teaching me I, i'm not a guitar player i'm not going to be a f guitar player and specifically not a flamenco guitar player but he's teaching me some flamenco guitar so just to learn like some rhythms and stuff so i'm just constantly around that and so um i wish i was the one that opened the 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 window f the door for me and also like Turning my attention to the fact that there's so much wisdom in this kind of music, um, so much ancient wisdom that people tend to miss, I think, like especially in Cuban music, because it could be cheesy sometimes. Uh, and like the jazz ego is kind of like, oh, I like, you know, my dish is more sophisticated. But then if you get through that, there's just like, I mean, it's 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 incredible, really, really. And so, yeah, that's another thing. And yeah, a bunch of other stuff that I learned from him. Mm. Well, it's interesting that, as to my knowledge, you don't try to do that. You know, you pursue your study of Cuban and flamenco music for your own pleasure and your own enrichment, but it, you don't, like, try to become that, right? Yeah, I just have too much respect for this. The, mm. the, I mean, these are guys that, that put as much time in, in playing congas and playing Montuno and pianos as I put in like studying jazz standards and working on Minecraft. So I, I can't just go oh, or like, maybe, you know, but it's, it's definitely in my playing. You're right. But it's, yeah. there, there's some other elements that I really picked up on in your playing. And my guess is, is some of them can be coming from you growing up in Israel. Uh, and mm -hmm. I want you to, elaborate a little bit just maybe maybe on on that that influence that that from list from growing up in israel how that music affected your playing yeah absolutely um so israeli music doesn't really exist because we're such a young country so like everything we call israeli music is borrowed from somewhere else you know like it's there's a lot of like moroccan music people came from like moroccan jews that came to israel um and then there's like tunisian music and ethiopian music and, and south american immigrants that came to it so it's like kind of like the, the new york of the middle east in a way mm. um <laughs> and so um i think what you're referring to as israeli might be more like oriental or like arabic music that i grew up uh listening to like the ornaments uh, some stuff that i borrowed from um from uh, balkan music I, i'm really uh in love with bulgarian music for many many years my my grandmother grew up in bulgaria she was born in romania and so like the the whole folklore thing that's going on there is, is, is insane um in terms of like phrasing the ornaments the different meters like you know the piece super comfortable playing in, in 11, 8, and 13, 8, and the gazillion 8, and everyone will be uh, comfortable 
with with it you know and and that for me was a big lesson of like oh wow so we can really expand on on the me whole meter thing and so the thief's dream for example on the record is in 13.8 very very quick four four five and so that comes from bulgarian music you know and so um that later on becomes a concept like an underlying concept uh, uh, underneath my composition so it wouldn't sound like bulgarian music but the the dna is is that you know mm. and so uh, yeah uh, definitely yeah the absolutely the or ornaments you said yeah. ornaments and that's such uh, a unique part that i i that i feel separates you're playing from from a lot of people that that didn't have that experience growing up and it made me think of bulgaria because I, I've listened to some Bulgarian music in the past, and there's certain ornaments that just sound so unique to that culture, and and I heard them in your playing, so, so yeah, that's sure. that's really cool to to hear that that your grandmother, right? You said your grandmother's from there. Yeah, yeah, yeah for sure. Uh, another element that you use a lot is pedals, like having like a pedal going, and then having a melodic line on on top of that, and uh, I, I've heard other in other Middle, Middle Eastern influenced bands. Uh, one of them, for instance, I don't know if you've heard of Marbin. They're they're like a jazz rock band from Israel. But uh, mm -hmm. but anyway, they in they utilize that concept of, of a pedal a lot. And I mean, uh, some jazz a lot of jazz artists also utilize that in times. But it it really struck out to me in in a lot of your compositions so would you say that that's that's derived from middle eastern roots yeah but I'm, I'm laughing because i have a friend uh in new york that he he made this funny comment he's like man israelis vamp way too much <laughs> <laughs> um i like that i like that but you know you have to live with it um and so uh that definitely, you know, that comes from 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 the from the folklore music, I guess for sure. Um, but to me, there's like a, an extra layer of why I do that, and and that um, is the layer of um, of sonic trust, I guess you could say. Which means, um, if you if there's one element in the music that is not moving. That you can latch on to and you, you keep hearing this a flat over and over again a flat a flat, a flat so you know after like five seconds you like you have this trust like okay so i heard it before it's still going and i'm gonna hear oh okay so we're we're in that land you know so you're, you're here with me and then i can i can take you to wherever i want and you're like it won't there won't be any danger of being detached of like losing the anchor you know and so it's really like a push and pull uh relationship that that pedals give you you know like uh um my favorite things coltrane impressions um so what all, all, all these like this model period um all that stuff is is um is great for so many reasons but the the the, the pedal point is what keeps it together it's just like this like c minor and then those try you know those like the the fourth that mccoy is playing to yeah. so you have that going on then and then coltrane is just going bananas on top of it and you know you you're, you're like someone's cradling you and the other one is like he's hitting you in the head you know so, <laughs> so it's a uh, it's really um it's a really useful uh tool when it's in the right context i, I guess um and coltrane for me is a prime example of the right context mm -hmm. so yeah can i ask um going back to what you we were talking about israeli music and you were saying there's kind of it's kind of it's kind of an abstract thing it's not really it's a melting pot right um but you know one of my cl closest friends he's actually he's also from tel aviv and he's really being big into these uh like israeli like older pop singer songwriter type of people like are you are you familiar with yoni rector <laughs> yeah of course of course yeah i, I don't want to be in, insult your, your knowledge of apparently oh, everybody oh. does but um uh but I've, I've learned some of his songs and 
yeah, a lot of triads, like you were talking about with a- Avishai. Um, yeah. But especially for being as popular as it was um, and as mm, kind of mainstream, I guess, like the, the phrase lengths are just so out of the ordinary. Like there's all sorts of five bar f- phrases and then like the, the form continues mm-hmm. and then a beautiful diminished chord. It's just like, it's very, um, uh, to a jazz musician's sensibilities, the harmony is just as enriching as any standards I play, if not more. And then there's, there's just a lot there. Is, is that genre of is, Israeli music, we'll call it, um, part of your development or something you really yeah, enjoy? Yeah, that's great. Great question and great that you, you heard of, of Yoni's music. Um, there are a few guys, I guess. Um, one be, one is Yoni, and the other one is called a guy called Mati Kaspi, M A T I A S P I, I guess. Um, then there's like the older, older guys like Sasha Argov, and um, that wrote really complex music that became popular, which is crazy. Um, this is a band called Kaveret, which means Beehive, um, and they they wrote some kind of like. St- I guess Stevie wonder if you want to make an equivalent, like a rough equivalent of like everyone will be, everybody will be singing the song perfectly in shows. It's just like, you know, eh, and then, and then you go to check it out and you're like, wait, what is it? And it's like, Oh shit. It's like, I didn't, I never knew it was so it's moving through so many keys or it's, it's really much more complex than I thought. And that's the genius of a good songwriter of being able to camouflage complexity. Mm. Um, and so, and so that complexity is definitely in a lot of Israeli musicians' ears um, of being able to hear complex stuff in in a sim in a kind of like a song rather than like hey check it out brainy jazz stuff. Um, so yeah, Yoni's one and Mati Kaspi is, is probably my my biggest influence in terms of um, Israeli composers. He's really Every time I take the time, every time I, I, I sit down and learn one of his songs, I'm so super. I'm like, man, he, how, it's so sneaky. Yeah. You know, this minor, <laughs> they're like, how, how I didn't, I, I didn't even notice it. There's like a passing minor chord, like super subtle be- before you go to that chord that everyone sings. And, mm-hmm. and then you know, until you sit, sit and transcribe it, you don't know about it. So, mm. yeah. yeah. There's another, uh, may- maybe you could talk about Hank and Charlie on your record. Oh, yeah. Named after Hank Jones and Charlie Hayden, right? So, 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 what what influence did those two guys have on you, and and what what made you decide to combine their names into one one piece? Mm-hmm. Um, the combination. Steal away, uh, right? Steal away, yeah. yeah. The record by by both of them. Um, they have two duo records. One's called Steal Away, and the other one is called um, Come Sunday. And these are beautiful beautiful records of them playing hymns and gospels and like christian yeah christian hymns um and i've been obsessing over steal away um s-t-e-a-l um for many years um and i'm so in awe every time i hear it by the by the maturity and on this on this record and it feels like um i heard vg i talk in an interview about about monk and and, and coltrane that record oh wow um and he said like it feels like you're listening to two sages speaking uh, i really love that and i kind of feel the same with hank and, hank and charlie with with these records um it's just like very wise, experienced people quietly speaking about life, you know. And um, that song is for them as a as a as a thank you, it's just a show of gratitude and, and respect to their their legacy and, and what they 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 taught us and the beauty that they left behind, you know. And so Hank and Charlie is, is very minimal. Um, I'm not a religious person, but it was written with kind of like a sort of a worship sensation in mind, whatever that means. I can hear that. Yeah. Yeah, I definitely hear that from from that that piece. Mm -hmm. Uh, 
Oh, you go. Go ahead. Yeah, I, sorry. I'm just jumping in. I was gonna. I I know Charlie Hayden's music, principally from his work with Ornette and Dewey Redman, right. and like very. Uh, uh, avant stuff, I guess. I'll use I'll use that yeah. term and. So that's part of the reason I love the Hank and Charlie stuff is that it's just Charlie in such a such a vastly different context. And Hank too. I mean, Hank played a lot more traditionally, um, generally speaking. Uh, but to, mm-hmm. to to see both of them, you know, dealing with triads, dealing with duet playing, dealing with melody, dealing with song in such a bass form. It, it is very beautiful, and I'm I'm so glad you included that tribute on the album. <laughs> yeah, sure. um, if you if, like, um, listen to the first track um, on on Steal Away, mm-hmm. and it sounds like it's triad. Like these are triads, but they have so much ah. hidden vices within each and every chord, you know. And so that that is that is that is true wisdom right there you know not to again not to shout at you like look it's complex it's like it's killing jazz chords like no it sounds like a triad but it's you know, it smells it smells different uh, i'll have to check that out deeper yeah. thanks for the tip yeah, yeah. also uh, i i recognize that sort of religious spirit uh just talking about that on you men the title track mm of the recording as well just just the way you start off too it's uh you, you know like how they, they associate like plagal cadences with church and i i don't think it was a plagal cadence it was just like a two going to the one right. but uh yeah you had yeah it just it, it had such it had it, it shared with it the feeling of warmth that a plagal cadence does mm-hmm. and i recognize that on on a, a nice portion of the record that you had this sort of uh, uh, religious type of church, like fervor <laughs> on it, which is I, I thought was really cool. Yeah, if if you're into Jewish church stuff, check out Jake Jake Sherman. He's the real he's the real guy. Oh, okay. Wow. <laughs> uh, fake news, but uh, <laughs> Jake, Jake is great. Um, you know Jake Sherman? No, I don't. Jake Jake Sherman, check check him out. Cool. Check him out. Do you think so? Yeah, go ahead. Oh, uh, yeah. So when you were writing these pieces, so I, I, I guess maybe the one we can focus on is the the thief's dream, sure. uh, which is a, a a really clever name, by the way. Mm-hmm. Just be, like you know, reversing the words, it makes it have a to- totally different meaning. So, yeah. so what comes first, the the music? And you're inspired by it, and then you create the title, or the concept, and then you create the music to try to match the emotion of that concept you want to illustrate. Yeah, a lot of times it will be music first because, um, to me, title f- title first would naturally imply trying too hard, uh, <laughs> like you said earlier. You know what I mean? Like, writing a song, like, I want to write a song called Human. Like, what the hell are you going to write? Like, it's, uh, how do you, you know? Mm. So, I just trust that the music will be, I, I just worry that the music will be honest or like trying to, to make them be as, as honest as, as it possibly could be. And then, then I listen to it and, and kind of trying to find, um, I mean, I have a lot of associations, but. There's always like an aha, aha moment, where like ah yes cool of course that's that's the deep dream of course how did and like how did I, how did I not think about that before <laughs> um, so like human t- time Hank and Charlie that was the the name came right after I wrote it it was so clear that this is what it was you know. Um, but but the rest I had to kind of like sit and and, and listen. Uh, it was Thief Dream was initially called. Uh, I know I wanted to invert it somehow, and it's like thieved, thieved dreams. I know it's not correct English, but I thought about doing that and try to kind of turn it around and until I until I hit it, I hit the jackpot. With, oh yeah, of course. Nice. 
can we speak a little bit about um, the prior project, which is the dreams, the the, the dream thief, which is yeah. the project that um, you know it's been out for a, a while at this point, but it, it was what introduced me to your music, uh, and I remember when I first listened to the album, I yeah I I didn't know at all the context behind. I didn't really think too much of the t- of the title, the Dream Thief, uh, and I was just listening to the album as the music it was until like the very. Uh, I don't remember if it was the last track, but at some point in there, like the Barack Obama speech is sampled in there, and then it was like a it was like a light bulb. The whole time I was like, all this music makes sense, and like <laughs> this is the context, and um, yeah, can you just is this after Sandy Hook and yeah right so sorry go ahead yeah I, was, I mean I, I I didn't see I don't know of any other jazz musicians who were speaking out on the school shooting crisis that was happening at that time um, yeah um this one has a personal angle um is that of um i'm sure you you heard that jimmy green you know jimmy green yes a yeah. player his daughter was one of the victims she was she was old um mm. and um yeah we played with jimmy um we recorded one of avishai's records and we did a few concerts together and then i played in Jimmy, uh, he came to Israel and, and played with the local quartet when I, when I was a kid and, and, I, and I was a piano player. And so I met him throughout the years and, and he's just one of, like, you know, he's a huge guy and, and with the best heart, like, it's such a, such a sweetheart, like a gentle giant and he's just such a beautiful spirit and, and, and it was always so great spend time with him and and obviously he's an incredible saxophone player um he played on a lot of abishai's earlier records Adama maybe wow i didn't even know yeah he's 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 great and i heard him at the blue note with abishai and mark before i before i joined the band and so i remember being in israel on the train and and reading the israeli newspaper and then seeing his daughter's face and i was like why am i because i knew I knew about the shooting and but then I'm like why am I seeing her and like I knew what I was reading but it, it didn't couldn't couldn't digest it and it's just really really heartbreaking you know like uh all, anytime that happens it's it's heartbreaking but especially if you know a guy it's so close to home and it's, it is home it's a jazz scene and we're uh, you know I I really see it as a community as an ecosystem of like you know we have brothers and sisters really like it's not it's not just a cliche it's really like it's a second family and when someone's being hit so hard it's uh it's truly heartbreaking and so yeah that was just a natural reaction to the absurdity of like man like how come that it's like that in this in the u.s it's so messed up like how why why you know and and i know obama and a lot of people before him and uh you now biden would hopefully try to more regulations um, regarding gun control and but it's it's a problem it's a huge problem so i felt the need to share my just to add a little my my own two cents on it Mm -hmm. or help spreading obama's words yeah Yeah. i actually to add a just a personal thing to this i actually wrote a project um in partnership with this organization called Change the Ref, uh, which was formed by a father of one of the students who was killed in the Stoneman Douglas, Florida shooting a couple years ago. And mm-hmm. he also uses it, this, this father, he has a nonprofit organization, like I said, called Change the Ref. Um, but one of the ways he speaks out for change and in response to these events is he's going to these all, all, all these major cities, Chicago, LA, and different places, and he's painting murals. Um, hmm. it's, it's hard to explain them without 
kind of showing them. So I'll just encourage anybody listening to check out uh, change. I think it's just changetheref.org. Uh, I'll just look it up okay. real quick. Yeah, I'll check yeah, it out. Yeah, changetheref.org. And yeah, the, the murals are, are super beautiful. <laughs> and it's just another great way of using art to to impact the world around us and speak out. Yeah, I mean, I don't want to take too much credit for it. I was like, you know, there's so much more to do. Yeah. And, and I'm trying to find the right ways of doing it. But yeah, yeah it's just a little a little, little gesture. But, but I, I would definitely want to speak more about I'm trying to find the right ways of addressing addressing uh, issues that are close to my heart um and i guess this is a good um chance to kind of again re, re acknowledge the, the the history of this music that we're playing and right. this is like american music and and i think we should all myself included try to find more ways of talking about that um yeah, I'm saying it with a lot of uh, humility to the fact that we all have a lot, a lot more to do than we, we are doing. So. Right, right. Yeah, we, we. I don't know, Mike, if you ever saw Jimmy around school, but around our freshman and sophomore year, he was working on his doctorate at um, at MSM, and I, and he, you know, he would have reading sessions for these crazy orchestrations with the, the Philharmonic and big band and things and I didn't I you know I didn't have the chance to really get to know him personally but um, you know just being who he is and I knew this about him you know so you know it, it definitely made the whole incident very real to see the father uh, yeah. right right there and still going about his life with so much excellence and you know, mm. moving on, it it was. Yeah. I definitely feel what you were saying about, you know, just knowing somebody deeply involved and feeling the need. You know. Yeah. Absolutely. Maybe uh, we we could talk a little bit about the production of your human, the recording. Uh, maybe just working with Manfred Escher and, and the whole process of going to France. All oh, right. I want to know about that for sure. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Um, um, so, okay. So let's start with the easier, with a shorter one, which is going to France. Um, ECM are working with uh, several studios around the world. Um, one is a studio in Louis. Lugano in Switzerland, and then they have uh, they work with uh, Avatar X Avatar Studios in in uh, New York that is now called Power Station. No. Yeah, yeah. Like Power Station. Owned by Berkeley now, I think. Owned by Berkeley, yeah, yeah, yeah. right. But that's I that's where I met Manfred. Um, well, I met, I met him when he was still Avatar Studios, and we recorded Theo Blackman's record called Elegy. Yes. It's a beautiful record that I encourage you to check out. Um, and, um, we, yeah. And then, and then, I, and then we spoke about collaborating and, and, uh, two years later, um, we went to record. So, um, the studio in South of France where we recorded human is one of the, I think they have like five or six, so that, that's one of them. And, uh, it's like middle of nowhere countryside, you know, and, um, um, the sound engineer is, is amazing. <laughs> His name is Gerard. I can't pronounce his last name. Sorry, but but it's it's on the record. It's a yeah. French last yeah. name, and he's he's great, man. He's so uh, he did, you know, he was one of those engineers that worked very quietly. I've been in sessions where the engineer talked to me like, "Oh man, I got this kidding compressor and like all oh, this EQ and like check this," and then this, this you can't even focus on anything, and usually the sound would suck. Yeah. Uh, because they feel the urge to the need to talk about it too much. You know, I'm sure you guys know. Trying too hard. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, <laughs> I always say, like, uh, on stage, like, a good... If I, like a, if a sound engineer, engineer did his, his or her work well, like, I, I, I didn't have to think about them during the show, you know? Yeah. And so, 
Um, I think I think that is so. The Gerard is like very very quiet, very quick, and and he got he captured such a beautiful sound. I'm not talking about the music here. Just the sound, the sound of the instrument is so crispy and yeah, it is and clear and like it was like uh, we were in the Philip and I were in the same room. The piano was here and, and he was he was right here and and then Offrey was in a booth and, and Jorge was in a booth. Um, okay. Which gave it an, an an edge of like, oh shit, we're playing in the same room. Like we can't really edit. Like there was there were barely any edits on the record. It was like maybe a note here, a note there. But it's um, so yeah, they, they did a wonderful work. And so that that's him. That's about the, the sound. Um, maybe he used a higher sample rate. Maybe not. I don't know. You guys asked me that before we started. I'll I'll ask. Yeah. I'm curious. I'm, I'm we were just uh, talking about that because. We interviewed Andy Clausen, and he recorded, I believe, in Switzerland. But apparently, Austin doesn't remember, <laughs> or maybe I'm just completely making it up. <laughs> but yeah, he he was working with a sound engineer that used like a ridiculous high sample rate that we that we both thought was like kind of crazy because like it's like almost impossible to hear the difference between that. But apparently, this guy like always used like the highest sample rate, and it, it's it was. Uh, and also just a yeah a ridiculous amount of amazing microphones and stuff but but going back to the recording uh that's definitely something i noticed is the the quality in which everything was recorded and especially on the solo piano piece on the record mm -hmm. the quality of the piano was mic'd with what was the room like yeah great question the room is like it was like a tent um ah. had this kind of shape Oh, it's like Rudy Van Gelder's. Have you have you ever been to that room? Been there. No, it's one of my dreams. No, I haven't. But he he is like a one mic, kind of. Like a lot of a lot of the classic recordings were with one mic, right? Yeah, Van mono stuff. on like everything. Yeah, I guess. Um, and so yeah, the, um, the tent tent like studio, the piano. Um, I was told by Gerard that that um. The piano sounds best in the center of the room, and and I I'm I'm using I'm wearing glasses uh, to see uh, I don't know if it's far sighted or near sighted but like I, I can't see from afar, and so I I don't like wearing glasses when I play, and so I said like sorry we can't put the piano here we gotta put it like right next to the you know the booth like with the be be Jorge's and Office. <laughs> Over there, and they were like, "No, but you're gonna lose the blood, the, the 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 beauty of the sound in the room." So it's like, "Okay, I rather sacrifice the sound for the spirit, you know." And there's so much information that can be um, exchanged when you play with people, like with like super subtle gestures or cues. That it, um, it was important for me to be close to them. Yeah. Um, and so there's this huge studio, and like we're in this like little cor corner, just like in this. Wow. this small square and off he needs to like when he gets out of the booth he needs to like skip over some cables and microphones and and i was like come on guys guys that's a huge space like why are you not here <laughs> so you guys all had had headphones on right to hear yourselves yeah uh, which in the dream thief we, yeah, the dream thief we had we didn't have any, uh no headphones no monitors not even a bass amp the dream thief was like yeah natural. well like, well there's a video of you guys online uh, it's just like a short compilation. I is it is it from the Dream Thief? Because yeah. you guys all seem to be set up in some sort of stage. Yeah, yeah, that's the Dream Thief. Yeah. Oh, okay. Really. So that's a very different recording format. Super different. And we had to kind of tiptoe and we kind of like this, mm. this is so hard because no headphones. Like you can't hear. I couldn't hear the bass, and so we had to play very quietly and and kind of. There's a piano. There's a grand piano between me and the bass right which yeah absorbs so much sound and so like as soon as Offrey gets a little louder with you know drums like the okay by bass and so um it was a very different process that that brought up brought out really like different energies that that is beautiful that wouldn't have come out any other way nice nice well this is all making me think of um you know just how awesome it is that you got to record in in the south of france with this all-star engineer in this great room and you know it it is with the help of ecm and i wanted to yeah. ask like you know what it was for you to be signed to ecm and 
maybe any advice for younger musicians who are looking at relationships with labels or you know that's something on their mind what has that done for you and how did you get to that mm. point absolutely it's a great question um yeah the whole pcm thing is a, is really a dream come true for me you know i've been i've been a fan since i started checking out jazz like i got introduced to, to their catalog through to Jarrett's um, repertoire, choreography, and then from there diving into all the craziness going on there. Um, this beauty, uh, and and uh, I love the, the aesthetics. I, I started playing classical music. That's how I start. You know, I started from Bach and Beethoven and and, uh, and WC, and so I really appreciate that set of the palette of, of colors. You know, and ECM they have a beautiful classical catalog, but they also like their jazz productions. Like uh, sometimes would use that same color palette and palette and so um uh, when we did a session with theo at, at avatar and my was like hey we should do something together i was like oh shit really <laughs> damn and so i was just very very excited and we started a long process of just like meeting every time he came to new york i would go to see him at his hotel and then we'll talk about like politics and anything but <laughs> but music for for a long time, then talk a little bit about the music. Say like, hey, we should do something together. Okay, bye. And then I would go back home. I was like, okay, what was that was mm. unexpected. And then like, you know, a few months later, he come to New York, and then we have this. Like, it it was a really long process, and now we're working together, and and, and it's it's great. I'm very 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 grateful. Um, the in terms of like younger musicians and relationships with label labels. It's a very complex question um, because the uh, the industry has changed greatly, um, and back in the day, talking about like 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, like if like labels were the the gatekeepers, you know, they if if you got picked up by by Verve or by Blue Note or by you know that that would make your career in some sort of um some sort of way because because there wasn't instagram there wasn't the internet where you can just release the internet. there wasn't band camp there wasn't anything like that and so these days um we have all these options um available uh to us and for some some people it makes more sense to release records on their own rather than than a label if you can't find the right label um that's and for for some people uh, you know if, if you find a door to one of the bigger labels that actually have like resources to to think about like artist development and artist relationship and like have a, a team that is that is dedicated it's of course it's it's a wonderful um thing but it's it's not obligatory you know like uh, i know a lot of guys that know how to do it by themselves you know they make a marketing plan you know some stuff that i would never be able to do that but but they, they they have a marketing plan and they have like a relationship with the different PR people and like they do their own booking. It's like it's a whole other profession, you know, and that is definitely uh, valid. And and a good example of it is a, my my friend, my good friend from uh, from Israel. His name is Oded Sur, a saxophone player that did all this stuff by himself for many years. He was going crazy, but he just he just persevered. You know, he just like day in day out just sat on you know practiced and then sat on the email like wrote like book tours um barely managed to pay us and it was like guys i'm so sorry this is what i have and we were we supported him and da, da, da. and then he got he just released an album with ecm now um so uh i think if you don't have um this door available to you right now as a young musician just keep on going like just it, it's it's going to be all right and even and and even if you don't you don't end up with a big label that's that's totally fine there's so many people like um i guess jacob collier would be a good example right that he he's like and an the child of the internet so he just put out some stuff on youtube and 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 that the rest followed so it's a different it's a different ball game these days and how do you feel about like jazz musicians and the internet 
and documenting every day and posting all the time and content creation as part of like an artist's life. I have um, I have a complex relationship with it, um, including what the the material that I choose to post or or not post. Um, um, on one hand, it's a great opportunity to be able to share the process with the people. You know, I put something out there that is not fully refined, or well, people you know post post. You see, like the, those girls, like posing, and they look perfect, and ha like they're they're not happy. It's like they just cut them off. You know, it's like it's a Photoshop world, and it's like that goes to to music as well, like finding the perfect take, the perfect one minute that re represent. What. So it's a it's a confusing it's a confusing place to be to be in. Um, to me, I'm happy that. Instagram came into my life at a later stage. That's that's what I would say. I'm happy that I had a chance to just play music, you know, just to practice and 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 workshop and my my work on my craft for so many so many years. And and now it's kind of like, hey, you know, found something cool, check it out, and 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 move on. But I think for for younger people, you know, children that that grow into that place of like instant gratification of like if you're not getting the likes and the love back, um, you, you're not good. You know, your self-esteem is hurt. It's a very unhealthy thing. So I generally encourage, generally encourage uh, younger people to, to try to disconnect from it as much as possible. And then there'll be time to share what you, what you need to share. So some people use it as a, a learning tool. Uh, just the idea of having to present something, yeah. record it and and put it out to the world and what do you think of that concept look in especially in, in covid days when we don't have any deadlines like you don't there's no show there isn't a show that you need to prepare like if you if you like uh, tell yourself hey i want to post this one minute shred video on giant steps and that makes you sit and practice for three hours. Then great, you know that's that's a good that's a good thing. So that's what I'm saying. It's a complex relationship. There's no like yeah. no yeah. clear clear answers. I'm just trying to um, constantly remind myself and also people that I get to speak to that it can't be what defines you. You know what I mean? It can't be what defines your your self esteem and how uh, like how many cats liked my status? How many da da da? You know, it's a it's it's a bottomless pit. It's a, it's a it's not a healthy thing. Yeah. Uh, maybe we could maybe we can uh, transition a little bit because I wanted to ask you this before about composition, and you said that um, you, uh, your process for a lot of the pieces you create is creating the music first, and then coming up with what what you think it it represents later. You know, hence the title names and stuff, and Again, I'll, I'll I'll reiterate it again that that the the story I I can hear visuals. I mean, no, sorry, I can see visuals in in a lot of the music you create, uh, just of the the title and then the music and how well they fit each other. But uh, maybe 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 I can ask this in like the terms of advice you would give to a a less experienced composer. But how, what's your approach to uh, creating music nowadays and and has it changed at all when you were younger and 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 what advice could could you have to to composing music oh wow that's a huge question um are you asking specifically about about covid days about corona days or or just in general no just just um in general how how as you grew as a musician how how is your composition process changed yeah for sure um so it started from a will to to have an effect you know i wanted to write music that will that will touch people and that will like take them through this journey and then in the b section we're gonna go up and people are gonna scream and blah 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 that was like 
I was 20, 24, 25, first record kind of first record days. Um, and I quickly became weary, weary of it. I became tired of going on stage, presenting that well-crafted whatever, you know, and, and then have people clap the same spots and saying the same things after a concert. I was, I, I started feeling like there's a missed opportunity here, you know, for something that is deeper. And then, and then, um, I started thinking more and more about music as some as a stimulating force, something that will allow simulate like creativity, you know, something that will just like send send you off somewhere, you know, um, and that could be um, it could be a line like I just heard a, a Ch Chikoria talking about playing with Miles, and he mentioned um, the song Agitation. Do you know that one? Yeah. ESP. Yeah, I think so. And so, you know, that composition is just like a send-off for this incredible quintet, right? And so that's super valid composing right there. Um, and then there's stuff that's much more more complex, um, like if we talk about like in a sentimental mood or, or Gigi, all this kind of stuff, which is super well, you know, it's very, very through, through composed. But my process with the musicians is always like, let's learn it the best we can, like know it inside out, and then forget all the comments I gave you. Forget all everything I told you that this song needs to be, and just do your thing. And so, compositions, yeah, it's kind of a cliche, but it's, that's how I see it. It's just, it's just a vehicle, I guess, for something bigger than that. Um, yeah. Well, Chat, we when asked... you were, oh, sorry, man. We we actually got an audience question that I think would be a good time. For... It, yeah, yeah, yeah. You kind of answered it in, in this, but um, actually the, oh, there's two. Uh, so the first one, it says, when you bring music into your group, how do you balance your vision and concepts with what your bandmates bring to the music? Yeah, so that's basically, yeah, that's, that's, that's what I said is like, um, I, I try to create like mini universes and mini planets, if you, want, if you will, that have like a certain like g gravity rules to them you know it's like it's an it's an f major so that's like the the core of the earth i guess and then you have like all these tensions that that are all drawn back to f like kind of mm. explain and so i would explain that to them i would talk to them about the groove i would say how i wanted to feel i can get super specific and uh, or not but the thing is really to always remember that like choosing the right musicians is incredibly important and if you have guys that are open and adventurous and they have like strong characters or or yeah all you have to do is to to open the door for them and say like hey just whatever you want musically and so some some in some concerts like i i, I have a let's say i have a song that is in seven and then or he would start playing it in six or in four or half a step up or like 50 BPMs slower or really? super <laughs> fast. And <laughs> the secret is to say yes as soon as it happens and, and, mm. and not say like, oh, no, that's not what I meant. Like, don't do not do that. You know, it's kind of like, oh. yeah, hell yeah. Let's let's do that. Shit. Let's play it. Let's play it in minor. See how that how it goes. I love that. You know? I... Yeah. Very nice. Should, should you have one mic or should I ask the second one? Uh, no, 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 I asked the second one. Okay, this, this, this question comes from a good friend of ours, Perrin Grace. He asks... Oh, Perrin. Yeah, he, love your song, Gail, Gail what? Oh, no, no yeah. love your song, Gail. And then he says, what inspired that one? Not Gail what? <laughs> Gail what? <laughs> uh, that, um, it's called Gal, and Gal is my little sister's name. Um, and oh, sorry. That's an exclamation what? point. <laughs> I thought it said Gale from afar. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's cool. Um, and that song came from a chord that I from I came with a B flat minor, or I guess flat 13, 7 chord. <laughs> um, and I just played it in sound check, and then I just said, oh, that's a nice sound, and let me just start arpeggiating, and I did this, and then like, let me, let me flip it around. And it's like okay, no, I like the first one, first one better, and then let me play it in rhythm. And it's like, oh, these are seven notes, and this is song in seven. Cool, awesome. Then I was like, I told Jorge, like, hey, how about you take those last three notes and double them? 
Oh, cool, we have a melody, cool. And then and then I wrote the melody coming from that. Uh, piece. But that, that was a chord. The, the initial inspiration was a chord. Yeah. Very cool. Speaking of, of Jorge, uh, another thing that I noticed, this, this certain technique that, that you, you have on your record a lot is I feel Jorge playing lines that are, that are so are more melodic in the upper register yeah and Ofri kind of just holding it having his own groove by himself on on the bottom um yeah. in a sentimental mood that's that's a big example but there's other examples on the record too where where it's a similar situation uh uh thief's dream i believe mm-hmm. in, in some parts of that too and uh that that's that's a pretty unique element that I, I haven't heard too much before, and it's it really it opens up the bottom end. But then when Jorge does go down to keep the groove, then it really makes it full, you know. But you don't feel like you're missing it. Uh, was that like a, a conscious decision you had in mind, or was that more of like an improv, like a improvisation type thing? The relationship between the, the different frequencies. I mean. Yeah, j- just like Jor- like Jorge takes on a, a different role from my yeah. ear in, in a lot yeah. of it, especially with in a, in a sentimental mood, you know, like doing those counter lines instead of yeah. holding down like a, a bass groove, you know, with 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 Ofri, you know, it's it's a different different yeah different yeah, role, yeah. Different that's role. that as I said, like he brought it on himself. Like I I didn't ask him to play in sentimental mood. He was he wanted to that because it wasn't written for a bass, and so so he. He's basically doing some Superman moves, playing piano music uh, on 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 bass. Um, so, but that that's made possible because he's so great and he has like this impeccable technique and and is that like he manages to be in tune like up there on the bass, which is incredibly difficult. And so, knowing that that tool is at my disposal allows me to explore these areas and. Um, back to film scoring for a second now I'm, I'm, I'm like I'm, I'm trying I'm learning like mixing and you know things like about about music production and uh, a big thing I mean the thing I guess one of the biggest things in mixing is about carving out frequencies to allow other instruments to be heard so in other words if the if the piano is too soft for you the, a lot of times the answer wouldn't be turning out the piano but but taking down the bass and taking down the the drums, making room, and right. so that that's done with like digital or analog, you know, devices. But if you talk about music, um, about carving space for other instruments, like or carving ca- carving out space for the bass drum, you know, mm-hmm. like a certain part of the drum set, you just like make room for it by having the bass player playing higher and then when he goes low maybe you can give him a strong instruction of like hey offer like maybe you focus on the higher frequencies like just play cymbals and, and snare just like think about that relationship that you guys have that will always like be one player like one player occupying as a a, a sonic uh territory i guess so and then we and i'll have that space in the middle to to explore things and then you have like a very full uh, picture of, of the frequency spectrum so that's that's one thing um, and then both of them can play can play at the at the bottom and then like unless you want that muddy sound of like a lot of bass drum and you know it's like first of all it's the tuning of the bass drum like how high how low is the, the bass drum tune but then it's like do you want that that these clashes then okay f- by all means you know go go for it or or you define like who's the king you know who's who's who has the priority in terms of in terms of uh, dynamics, and you say like, I I want, you know, definitely play the bass drum, but always have the the bass heard. You know, all these kind of talks that we will have on the train station that would be super interesting. But then again, when we go on stage, I just forget about it. And if it just mm. if you feel like playing going to bass drum land where Jorge when Jorge is down, do that. It's it's your artistic choice. I trust you. Um, De- definitely. Yeah. Uh, fr- from my experience, mixing. Uh, jazz, jazz music and such. Uh, and just listening to jazz, you know, especially having experience mixed, uh, you develop a certain sense of sensitivity towards the placement of certain instruments in the mix. And bass 
for the majority of, of jazz always is above the bass drum. But uh, if you go to music context like rock, rock and roll, for instance, it's, it could be a very different spectrum. But uh, yeah, so so you would have talks like this with your bands, but just not not like like you're, you're making a good point that once you're on the stage, you forget about it. But yeah, you can't. And yeah. No. Yeah, of course, because you, you have to clear your head and, and let the music be the music. But uh, that's that's interesting. So so how deep would you go with with the band talking about like the, these type of concepts? depends like we would yeah we could go pretty deep we can spend like a good you know three hour train all right talking about frequencies and tra- talking about like a different bass microphones that would allow that to to come out on stage and like totally nerd out about a lot of these things and um yeah but really like if you if you drink a lot of beer your le- your foot is going to be heavier on the bass drum that's just the nature of how you know just the <laughs> physical reaction <laughs> And I rather hearing your drunk bass drum rather re- than you trying to make carve room for the bass after five beers. Like no, you know, you're drunk. Also. Just go for it. It has a certain energy that I love, you know. So <laughs> Yeah. On like it's funny that you mentioned like your bandmates being drunk and I it's not <laughs> Well not you, saying that. No no no. <laughs> well five beers, you know. <laughs> but um Collectively. I mean, it's just very clear that you, Jorge, and Ofri have just, like, a great hang relationship as well as a musical one. And you also touched on it when you were um, talking about when how your relationship with ECM began. Like, you would meet the, Marty, was it? or Manfred? Mon, M- Manfred? Manfred. Manfred. Yeah, yeah Manfred. you would meet him and you would talk about not anything else besides music. And definitely not really yeah. business. It was just kind of like a passing comment, like let's do this sometime. Um, yeah. And I, I see this again and again that it's just really genuine human relationships that lead to opportunity and lead to great collaboration and things. Can you? Um, I don't know if you have any of your favorite relationships with your peers that like you and Jorge have this great thing going or just speak on the value of relationships in our music in general i'd love to hear your thoughts yeah. on that. yeah absolutely i mean i i really respected manfred's uh, way of like wanting to create a, a relationship be- before hitting record uh, that, that was great because like these days everything is like, especially in new york city like everything is so like oh cool you're a graphic designer oh awesome you're an animator great let's make a movie like boom 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 you know deadlines and you have the thing going in a, in, in a week which is great um, I love this rhythm but then Manfred is like super old school and he's like no I gotta you know gotta learn to know each other and and um, I respect it and, and you, you you you're absolutely correct with about my relationship with Jorge it's it's like um, 10 years almost nine nine ten years of, of playing music together and um, it's a uh, it's irreplaceable. It's like it's it's really priceless. Like the, we we know each other so well, and you know, it's like that. Like you could, I could hint an intention that is not clear in my mind even on stage of like building up f- for the next three minutes, like letting music simmer, and you know, like I could hint it, and then Jorge would be like, "Oh, I, I hear you," even before I realized what I, uh, you know, he'd be there before me and 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 vice versa and it's really a great it's a great feeling you know it's like uh um because we we really take a lot of chances on on stage so it's a it's a it's a combination of like a lot of trust and then a lot of like unknown you know land um choices that we make and um yeah i i encourage you guys to 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 keep bands together or parts of bands together you also you grew up with Ofri, right? In Israel? We yeah, we have like ten years nine, ten years between us. So like uh, we met occasionally in Israel, but but oh. we yeah. Yeah. Alright, so um is there any Well I think this whole conversation has been a great testament to the depth of this record and the depth of you as an artist. We've talked about 
Israeli music to Hank Hank Jones to uh, Char- and Charlie Hayden and Jorge and Philip and all, all these different things. Uh, but is there anything you want to say about Human uh, or about your upcoming work that you would like any listeners to hmm. know? Um, by Human, no, I just just listen the record we we did it so you guys uh, can enjoy it and and just um i don't want to put too too much thoughts in you know into a person's head like uh, before listening to it it's uh mm. hopefully it speaks for itself um for the pu- future project as i uh, as i said like i'm i'm working on the the like the film scoring would definitely be a parallel career uh for me that's something that i very very much uh, into that that leads also to um led actually already to production work with other artists that i didn't expect it to happen but as you know you, you become more experienced with the software and then then you have the, the musical knowledge and then if you get if you get a grasp on technology then it's a it's a very nice combination to have at your disposal mm-hmm. and then i have friends here in israel right now we're in corona day so um the, the live collaborations are people coming here um that we're working on their music, and we were. I'm working now with a amazing Yemenite singer. We're working on some music from the Sahara with like beats and, and like electronic stuff, and wow. and um, yeah. So like the whole production uh, aspect of music is definitely getting stronger um, as well. Like producing for other artists, um, and I think one of the f- well, there are three things that I think that will happen um, for me in terms of my band leader career in the next few years one will be um actually four i'm gonna keep playing with with the, with the quartet because we just started um so that that will happen um there will be at some point a solo piano record that i want to make um yeah. maybe a standard record um jazz standard record i'm still thinking about that um there will be a, uh, an album at some point that will include the production world and and the piano um some sort of hybrid electronic hybrid i don't i, I don't even know what what that would be and um an or- orchestral writing um something with an orchestra mm. so that will happen um in the future as well so um yeah there's actually the- um well first of all it's very exciting to hear about all these uh upcoming projects especially with the production it sounds like covid and corona is even pushed you to to new places and it's you know equally as enjoy well not equally but um enjoyable in different ways right mm-hmm. but we actually got several audience questions just here in the last couple minutes um yeah why don't we 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 try to do these in some type of short answer format because some sure. of these, yeah, yeah. these topics are kind of large. We could go for forever on them, you know. Uh, but this is from Gadi Lahavi. <laughs> <laughs> terrible, <laughs> terrible. I, I know. But hey, yo, he says, yo, can you talk a bit on what is improvisation to you? Keith once said improvisation is from zero to zero. How does that fit mm. in arranged slash composed music? Mm. Gadi, come on, man. God is uh, one of my best friends, and and he's just messing with me with those big questions. Um, <laughs> yeah. He's Great. an amazing piano player. You should check him out. Okay. Um, so, what was the last part of the question? How does that relate to what? arranged or composed music? Ah. Wow, man. So. Yeah, I guess in in improvisational context. It would be more obvious of just like you know Keith going on stage not knowing what he's gonna play and just like playing one note, two notes, and then following following the the line and and then then ending. So that that's that zero to zero is is pretty obvious. Um, with composition, um, Manfred chose time to be the first song on the record and I think that kind of explains that way of thinking um, so he heard it and that's like a composed song it's like a, and it's basically just E major for five minutes and as soon as we played it it was like one of the first 
No, I think it was mid session that we played it, mid, mid mid recording session, and he was like, "That's the first song of the album," and we were like, uh, "Cool, but you haven't heard the other stuff, and the song that I had as in mind as the first." And he's like, "No, that's the first song of the album," and he was so he was so confident uh, with that um, that it made me think like, "Oh, I I, I see this coming from zero, because that song uh, is an uh, introduction. It's like a musical handshake yeah. of like." Hey, here's E major for you, you know, and then some things, but not too much. And then like second song is when we start like diving in. Um, and the same process happened with the last song. Uh, we played, we played that song and he was like, that's the last song of the record. <laughs> and again, we were like, really? But uh, yeah, that's, that's the last song of it. And like, as time went by, we, we realized that he, he was right. Um, it's a cool farewell. So I think um, set, set list would be like a good, um, Expression of zero to zero, choosing the right set list uh, on on the rec on the record because we don't have set list on, on stage. Um, yeah, but yeah, that that's definitely one thing that comes to mind. Thank you, Gary. Yeah, and then he asked a second question, which is related. He says, "How do you avoid the traps of coming to improvisation with premeditated ideas?" I got it. So I when I I get to teach um, quite a lot these days because of Corona and um, one of the subjects that keep, keeps coming up in lessons um, to me is a sub is a, is the subject of a, of um, a question mark. I love hearing a question mark in music. I love hearing. Just yesterday, I had a student who came, like a 16-year-old piano player. Great, like, really. He's like, it's gonna, you're gonna hear about him. Um, and he uh, came in and played one, one of the one of his songs, and it was it was kind of square. It was this, uh, it was beautiful composition, like really influenced by like a lot of chick was in there, a lot of like different influences. Uh, but it was kind of like in cubes, you know. It's just like chord, chord, chord. chord. And I, and I told him like man I, I feel like I want to hear more of a question mark uh, essence in your, in your in your playing and that means like when you play like you know maybe just wait a little before you play that next chord and, and ask like do I want to play it do I this chord has like f four notes am I hearing each and every note or not and if if the answer is 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 not then then eliminate what you don't what you don't hear and basically put a question mark on each and every and everything that you uh, that you play, and so with improvisation, it's really that like is the next note true or not? Mm -hmm. And if it's not, go left, go right, do something else. I That's like my that a short. Is, Just a, a quick comment on true? that uh, on your song "Mystery and Al your piece "Mystery and Illusions." You really have a nice pause in the melody going mm -hmm. into that, and, and what you were just saying about. Uh, having some pauses in music and and seeing where they're appropriate, it it reminded me of that. And and when I heard it, it it uh it, it sounded so right at that moment. So it's uh that yeah, I just wanted to to say that. Mm -hmm. oh, the essence of question marks and yeah, interesting. Yeah. Okay. So last question comes from. A French name that I'm not going to attempt, but th this ah. is this comes from uh, back when we were talking about the frequencies of production, but also of live playing. Uh, and this person commented on the proficiency of ear that you would need to hear something kind of that subtle, uh, and then asked, "How did you? How much did you consciously work on your ears, um, young so and much. later?" So much. Constantly transcribing, um, working with, you know, ear training applications on the phone, studying with an ear training teacher. Um, oh, really? Just a few days, I transcribed. I transcribed a Coltrane solo, and my mission was to transcribe it without a piano. So I'm just basically like looping the A section and just like sitting and, and getting like, a sm like the next note, like next time, next time around, it's like oh, it's a B flat, okay, and then we wait, and then the B flat goes to, and then it does, and then it's like C C C, you know, like, but no piano, which is yeah, ear training. So ear training is super, super important to be able to communicate in a, 
in a coherent way and react um, spe a specific way. Like, like some player played that note and so you know that this is a B flat and so you can harmonize it in, in a certain way. So definitely um, a lot of ear training work there. Um, and the application that I would recommend that you check out is called Harmonomics by John Nastas, who's the same guy okay. who did the program uh, Metronomics, which is a great metronome. I mean, Harmonomics is a wonderful um, ear training application. Very That's great. Cool. Just a quick side note, uh, what's your opinion on slowing down the tempo of things using an application such as Amazing Slow Downer to help transcribe? Yeah, uh, you know, it, 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 it works on a different set of tools. Like rather than developing your the speed of like he hearing a shape and knowing what it is, you kind of like you, you look under the hood. You like you, you have a uh, chance to look under the microscope. So mm -hmm. it's different. Yeah, I actually you you posted that train uh, transcription actually in uh, right. Yeah, that was the one. Okay, yeah, that that's was the one, one you're talking about. And I I was pretty struck with how you know like train is bending notes on the saxophone, and you were emulating that on the piano but the way like with your touch and everything it, it sounded very gestural like a bend <laughs> and I, I really mm. enjoyed that but not a question I just I thought that was a cool mm. thing that you you had done um, but Mike did you have anything final or no uh, no cool no. so um, actually 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 um go for it I saw that you posted a couple of things and uh, about Chick Korea, and mm -hmm. I wanted to just ask you if if you wanted to right. have anything to say on on our podcast about Chick Korea and, and his passing and, and what he meant to you. Um, I can talk about it for hours, really. Um, but as we as we're ending, I'll just say that um, it's been yeah, it's just a part of who I am, and it's part of. So many other people's personality, musical personality. Um, it's this is really there's too much to mention, but like um, the generous spirit and the, the innovation and and the courage that he took with him everywhere is really uh, helped shaping who I am, and I'm I'm very very grateful and it was very very sad to hear about his passing and so. But that's life, unfortunately. Yeah, there was something you said. It, I remember you, you saying, if Chick isn't arrogant, then no one should be. And no. uh, that's a very nice statement. And it, it stuck with me. So. Great. All right. All right, Shai. So we like to end our podcast with a 90 second fire round of very complex life questions. <laughs> uh and so you know thank you so much for being so generous with your time and i've learned a lot and definitely have a much better understanding and appreciation for the record and you as an artist and i'm looking forward to the the work you keep producing yes uh, so 90 seconds starts in Go. 10 9 8 7 6 5 4 3 2 1 What's your go-to deli order? Oh, wow, um, like a veggie burrito thingy. A veggie burrito <laughs> thing. Okay. Um, what is your opinion on Mamoon's falafel in the village? It's 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 good. It's good. It's not as uh, as good as it. stuff. Sorry to be a little. Uh, yeah. Of course. <laughs> what what's the best place to get falafel in New York City? <laughs> Probably Mamoons. Probably Mamoons, but <laughs> it's not Israel. Uh, mm, mm, worst gig you've ever played? Wow. Um, I was playing alto saxophone in a wedding. In a <laughs> wedding. <laughs> a bar I, was, I was like, the war, I'm the worst saxophone player you've ever heard in your life. Like, seriously, bad. Amazingly bad playing. Wow. That was probably the word. <laughs> uh, what was your first word? I don't remember. <laughs> I don't remember. Um, uh, mm, favorite pop artist? Oh. Uh, 
Stevie. I mean, so many, but yeah, if I have to choose one, Stevie. What's the most? Imp oh, is that it? That's it. Oh, that's quite loud. It's oh, sorry, sorry. Um, yeah, I can't get over this. Sh like some poor couple is like you know saying I do, and the, the videographers recording it, and Shy Maestro is like <laughs> blaring saxophone in the background. <laughs> it was terrible. It was really. Loud. <laughs> I'm glad Instagram didn't left it. Okay, well, uh, to everybody thank listening, you. yes, thank you so much um, to Gotti, Perrin, Joe, and all of you for the beautiful questions. Thanks for tuning in. Thank you to Shai for yes, your time. You. Uh, what an enjoyable conversation, and um, we hope to have you back one day and to hear the rest of your projects. Absolutely. Thank you so much, guys. It's been great. Yes, thank you so much. See you around. Yes. Take care. Bye. Bye-bye.